When I was an undergraduate student looking to apply to graduate school in physics, I asked a professor at my school what he recommended I work on before graduate school. I was particularly unsure if I wanted to take on more pure math courses or double down on my computational background. His answer was simple but very strong. If an interesting problem could be solved by hand, it had been solved decades ago. The best path for me would be to focus on computational methods to be successful working on the problems of the day. But this of course was an oversimplification on his part. I for example have already made contributions to a number of analytical results. But there is some merit to what he said. There are simply a lot of open and very interesting questions in physics with no obvious way to progress analytically. Computational methods provide a powerful framework for us to study problems we are particularly interested in on this channel. Many body physics, condensed matter problems, and other general problems in statistical mechanics often occur specifically in models where you cannot write down general or exact solutions by hand. So computational approaches give us sometimes the only theoretical tool to proceed in our endeavor to understand the world around us. What's going on everyone? I hope this video finds you well. My name is Jonathan Riddell and today we will give an incomplete and simple introduction to a few numerical methods used by scientists today. This will be part one in a three-part series. We will today focus on diagonalization techniques, which are the most direct and simple example of modern algorithms. Future videos will feature tensor network methods and Monte Carlo methods. Before we jump into it, I will be doing a stream on the 16th of May at 7 p.m. Eastern to answer questions about the video or anything else uh, about the channel or topics you might be interested in. James Lambert will join in again and we will share some funny stories about debugging code and getting algorithms up and running, which can always be, you know, a tedious time. Also, in the description, I have left a link to an introduction to numerical techniques by Anders Sandvik. If you want to potentially implement the algorithms I introduce here, I recommend you give it a read. It's important to ground the discussion by mentioning what we might actually be interested in calculating and what this forces us to try and simulate. Physicists studying uh, condensed matter problems are often interested in quantum phase transitions. Quantum phase transitions study the transition between exotic quantum phases of matter at zero temperature, where quantum fluctuations play the important role as thermal fluctuations are absent. These transitions happen as we vary some controllable physical parameter affecting the physics we are studying. When I say zero temperature, I am more formally thinking of the properties of the ground state of the material, the state that corresponds to the minimum energy our system can take. Popular examples of these transitions are the superconductor to insulator transition, which is quite the dramatic change in the behavior of the electrons. Or another example concerning magnetism would be the paramagnetic to ferromagnetic phase transition. This is of course a really hot topic as it presents phases of matter that could potentially be extremely useful for future technologies. The next big property we might be interested in is finite temperature properties of a material, including finite temperature phase transitions. When studying this, we usually use the canonical uh, ensemble written here in the density matrix language of quantum mechanics. Studies here vary the temperature and then at some finite temperature called the critical temperature, we see some fundamentally different behavior. A typical example of this would be the two-dimensional Ising model, which can go from zero magnetization to high magnetization after a thermal phase transition. 
I made this plot that you see here in a past project about this particular phase transition. The y-axis here is the magnetization of the Ising model, and the x-axis is the temperature minus the critical temperature. On the plot, you can see Onsager's exact solution of the magnetization curve, and in blue, you see my numerical solution uh, with an algorithm called the tensor renormalization group method. The key point here is that below a certain temperature, the material being modeled by the Ising model would spontaneously magnetize as you lower the temperature, which corresponds to a phase transition. The third type of problem one might be interested in would be time evolution. So this problem more or less involves solving the Schrodinger equation and tracking some observable in time. Uh, here we are interested in things like going to equilibrium, how entanglement might build up, and of course, many, many other things. Somewhat tied to this, but perhaps a fourth problem would be investigating properties of excited eigenstates. This of course becomes really uh, interesting for people studying things like the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. This however gets extremely expensive computationally and there aren't as many avenues to study this particular problem. So what's the problem here? Why isn't this easy? To see why this is so hard, let's take our standard example that I regularly appeal to on this channel, the spin 1 half degrees of freedom interacting on a lattice. This example will serve as our intuition to describe the methods later, and it's certainly a standard and intuitive way to introduce a number of interesting computational methods that we'll see as this series progresses. A typical model in this context for magnetism could have Heisenberg-like interactions. This interaction is shown in the following expression, where the S plus um, is the typical raising operator and the S minus is the lowering operator. We also have the SZ uh, uh, term, which is the typical spin Z operator. The I and J uh, indices represent different lattice sites, and usually this interaction is taken between nearest neighbors, uh, but sometimes you also use it for uh, longer range interactions. I encourage you to convince yourself that this model will not change the total number of upspins and the total number of downspins for a state being acted on by this interaction. An example state would be up on site I and down on site J. Assuming they don't destroy the state, the spin flip operators always raise one spin and lower another as they are paired together. The spin Z operators wouldn't change the direction of the spins at all uh, as we are working with the spin Z basis. So our problem mainly lies with how many states one might need to investigate while sprinkling in entanglement and other quantum weirdness. If I have one spin, I have to contend with two possible spin configurations. I can of course represent states as superpositions of this, but this means I need to supply two numbers, A and B, to fully describe my state. Two complex numbers isn't so bad from a storage perspective. If I go up to four spins, this number doubles since, e since each spin can individually be up or down. For every state, I must specify four complex numbers to store the state properly in the memory of my computer. As you might imagine, if I add a third spin, I now need to store eight total complex numbers. So this is kind of getting away from us, right? If I had instead n total spins, we would need two to the power of n complex numbers. So even for modest n, uh, this number is absolutely monstrous. For example, doing 14 spins would take over 16,000 complex numbers to properly represent a state. 
This is roughly the limit of a computer with about 16 gigabytes of RAM before we need to start uh, taking more advanced approaches into account. So now that we know uh, why this is so hard, we can jump into describing methods that help us overcome this crazy storage problem. These methods attempt to solve for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian directly. An example of diagonalization would be full spectrum diagonalization, meaning we solve for every eigenvalue and eigenvector at the same time. It's important to remember throughout this discussion that our Hamiltonian H um, is just some matrix, so linear algebra techniques uh, will be very useful for us here. This has benefits if you want to study properties of many eigenvectors or wish to calculate dynamics and other properties exactly. The only numerical error here is introduced by the eigensolver algorithm. One can go one step further and use block diagonalization techniques reaching sy uh, system sizes of around uh, maybe 24 interacting spins. If we only wanted to study the ground state, we can more or less double this accomplishment of 24 spins by using a clever projection method. There is an algorithm called the Lanxos method of finding the ground state, which is a type of Krylov space method. So let's take a quick look at block diagonalization, then discuss the basic idea of Krylov uh, spaces, and then briefly we'll describe uh, how these things relate to the Lanxos algorithm. Oftentimes the Hamiltonian we work with has underlying symmetries. These end up being powerful tools for us to do block diagonalization. To illustrate this, we will assume that our Hamiltonian H is again acting on a lattice, but now we'll talk about uh, the fact that it conserves the total magnetization in the Z direction. We write the operator for the magnetization in the Z direction as a sum over all of the spin one half operators in the z direction. Here we assume that our two-dimensional lattice in this example has some points on the lattice labeled by x and y. If our Hamiltonian conserves mz, what we really mean by this is that h and the magnetization uh, commute with each other. From linear algebra, we know that if two matrices commute, we can simultaneously diagonalize them. In a more quantum language, the magnetization in the z direction in our example is a good quantum number. For computational purposes, what this tells us is that the Hamiltonian doesn't connect regions of states with different magnetization, allowing for us to block diagonalize. So our Hamiltonian is originally written in such a way that we must consider this whole big blob of red here, which we imagine is a huge matrix of numbers uh, that we have to consider all at once. But if we cleverly rewrite our basis vectors, or in this case, just reorganize them, we can get a matrix that instead looks like this. The middle block here, for example, could be the zero magnetization sector. Block diagonal matrices are nice because each block can be diagonalized separately, great re greatly reducing uh, the problem at hand. This method, of course, doesn't get you very far per se, only to about 20 to 24 spins, uh, and depending on the model, this number can actually be lower than that. Um, and just to be clear here, a lot of questions uh, we are interested in, certainly at face value, require more interacting particles to fully investigate. I mean, we are interested in the thermodynamic limit here and the emergence of statistical mechanics and its applications. There are, however, many things one might look at with system sizes this small, like convergence to the property we are interested in in the thermodynamic limit, or short time regimes where the observable hasn't realized that perhaps it's sitting on a finite lattice yet. Many Hamiltonians have other symmetries that can be exploited to push this method further. For example, if we assume our lattice has periodic boundary conditions, we might be able to impose 
impose uh, translation uh, invariance. In the zero magnetization sector, there is often spin flip symmetry where the physics doesn't change if you flip all of the spins at once. If all of these symmetries likewise commute with each other, we can further block diagonalize the Hamiltonian, make our, making our blocks smaller and smaller. Though a fair warning, every new symmetry you insert somehow doubles the amount of code and effort required uh, to get the algorithm working. So now let's discuss Krylov space techniques to get us into larger system sizes. But here we are going to isolate ourselves to only looking for the ground state and perhaps some other low-lying energy states. Consider some arbitrary trial states psi. Hopefully uh, it's not orthogonal to the ground state or we sort of can't start. Um, but we can write psi in terms of the energy eigenbasis where we have made the choice to call m the total size of our Hilbert space, so m is equal to 2 to the power of n, where n is the total number of lattice sites. If we choose to act the Hamiltonian on our state a total of lambda times, we see that the eigenvalues pop out of the expression and are taken to the power of lambda as well. If lambda is large, we see that the energy with the largest magnitude will dominate this sum. Pulling out the biggest possible eigenvalue from this expression, we can rewrite it as follows. This is obviously a long equation, but the big takeaway here is that the biggest eigenvalue will dominate this expression as the ratio here will disappear as lambda gets large. Therefore, we see that this method projects out the largest eigenvalue slash eigenvector pair, or we might say that it finds the vector that has the largest eigenvalue in terms of its total magnitude. To guarantee that this is the ground state energy that we find, we can simply subtract a sufficiently large constant off of the Hamiltonian and apply the new Hamiltonian uh, to the state. To define the Langsos method, we need one more step. So let's define our Krylov space. We define the new vectors labeled by J such that they are the resulting vectors from acting the Hamiltonian uh, J times on the initial trial state. We do this from J is equal to zero to J is equal to lambda, giving us our Krylov space vectors. The Langsos method uses these vectors to form an orthogonal basis such that the Hamiltonian is written as a tridiagonal matrix. While we don't show it explicitly here, it's a straightforward extension of what we already have. Once you have your tridiagonal matrix, you can then solve uh, this new eigenvalue problem and recover the ground state. An important note here is that the tridiagonal matrices are less computationally complex to diagonalize uh, versus more general matrices. With, me with this method, as we said previously, we might be able to double the system size compared to a complete diagonalization method. However, this will come at the cost of only studying ground state physics. But when you are only interested in quantum phase transitions, this is obviously a worthy sacrifice, as the other states probably aren't as interesting. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, I would love to hear your funny stories about struggling to code up uh, some methods or your experience in computational methods. I know I certainly have plenty of funny mistakes, obscure bugs, and so on, and I'll definitely be sharing them uh, on the stream. As always, guys, I hope you liked the video. If you did, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I hope to see you at the stream.